Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa an'im ala habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, we're very happy. Oh, I was, yeah, assalamu alaikum to the audience first. <laughs> for uh, chiming in, inshallah, from all the different platforms. And assalamu alaikum to our two beloved shiyukh. We have Sheikh Yasser and Sheikh Osama with us. How are you guys doing, Sheikh? Zayl full. Alhamdulillah. Bekhair fadlu min Allah. Alhamdulillah. 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 It really is very, uh, I, was, I was telling the shiyukh before we started recording, it's very beautiful to see your faces again. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, for the first time ever on the meeting point, uh, we have a guest with us, alhamdulillah. Um, and it's someone I think that's very dear to all three of our hearts and someone who I think is going to add a lot of um, benefit, inshallah, to our conversations whenever he's able to join us. Um, and that's Dr. Ahmed Yusuf. I'm going to kick it over to him, inshallah, to introduce himself briefly and then... Um, we can get right into the topic. So you can just start us right off, inshallah, after you introduce yourself to the audience a little bit. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Thank for inviting me and, and for letting me the opportunity to kind of sit with you both and, and, and Zaid uh, for, for hosting. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, my name is Ahmed Yusuf. I'm a born and raised Jersey kid of uh, Muslim immigrant parents. I, I grew up in the same community as the three beloved shiuch um, and, uh, you know, two beloved shiuch and, and, and Zaid Sheikh. <laughs> by proxy um good, good and, course correction no no not even by proxy just two beloved <laughs> two and zaid i was i was mentored heavily by by, by uh sheikh yes and zaid uh through a good portion of my life and continue to be and then obviously had had uh, an awesome opportunity to watch sheikh osama grow up and then and then become somebody that um i you know it, it used to look up to me and now all of a sudden i get to look up to him which is pretty cool um and, and that's a that's a cool experience i i was born and raised in that similar North Jersey community. I grew up uh, and went to the same Islamic school, um, you know, that, that, that two of you have gone to and, uh, and, and was in the North Jersey bubble of the Muslim community, right? And I was in Halakat and, and, and pretty heavily involved in the masjid and those kind of things. Uh, I got married to um, a woman who went to school with me in the same Islamic school and we stayed in the same NJIT undergrad bubble, Muslim bubble in the MSA, uh, went to the same university for, for medical and dental school and subsequently um, you know, got married in medical school and, and, and finished our residencies in Newark and the Bronx, respectively, and then decided we were going to try something different and move away from kind of the, the kind of the heavy, uh, <laughs> the, the really busy things that make New Jersey not great beyond all the things that make it great, but to take a break. And we ended up in Arkansas um, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, the, the two or three major reasons, one was to be transparent, was the cost of living is about half as New Jersey. And uh, we both had significant amounts of student loans to pay off. And and the, and the pay was better. And so that those two things were the big primary reasons we, we knew we needed to leave for at least a little while. And the third reason was I had always had this feeling, uh, you know, um, that, uh, that, that most of the country, uh, you know, just hadn't really experienced what a, a normal Muslim American kid guy was like, and that a lot of the negativity that we had experienced post 9-11 as teenagers into our young adulthood that defined my young adulthood um, in terms of, of the typical stereotypical stuff. I thought that was just a product of people not having ever been exposed, right? Especially in places like Arkansas. And so that was always in the back of my head as a place, the kind of place I wanted to be, you know, to test the waters. It's my hypothesis true that if you, if you kind of get a reasonable end of one or two, right? I mean, my wife uh, in a place where they never have experienced Muslims before uh, with funny names and a muhajiba and all the normal things that there was a chance that maybe you could change the way people thought about Muslims forever, right? And so that was one of the reasons we made the move to where we were. And we, we ended up here. I've been here for five years now. I plan on only being here for three, right? In that time, I was uh, uh, kind of, my, my arrogance to think that I was going to influence a whole bunch of people was quickly shattered. And, and probably the contrary happened, right? And I think in a positive way, hopefully, um, was, I was I was impacted in reverse, probably as much as I may have impacted people around me. Um, and I was often, and I am in Benton, Arkansas, uh, often the, the end of one for, for most of the people I work with and, and my neighbors and, and, and so on in the community in terms of being a Muslim person and definitely an American born uh, 
American cultured Muslim. I'm sorry, Ahmed, I'm, I'm not catching this term you're using, the N of one? Yeah, a, a sample size of one, right? You know, in, in, in research, right, you do, uh, <laughs> you, one of the ways you assess the power of research, right? We all have to know this now because of vaccines. Um, a study is very strong when you have an N greater than, you know, a few thousand, right? And then you say, oh man, that's pretty credible data, right? And uh, my feeling was, it works in reverse too, right? If your only anecdotal experience is one person to represent an entire, uh, <laughs> you know, religious background, a billion people, then first thing, you kind of have to be on your game, right? Because you, you feel the burden of that. I think that's something my wife tells me all hijabis feel, right? They feel this, they're immediately representative of the whole entire Muslim, <laughs> right? Universe, <laughs> despite its lack of being a monolith, but you know, that's the, the nature of people. And uh, it was a cool opportunity to be able to be that, that person, right? Um, and so, yeah, as time passed, and this is where kind of the beginning of my question begins, I guess, and the topic is introduced. I was able, for the first time in my life, to really develop strong relationships with people outside the Muslim community, right? I think- Just a quick question before you move on. So as a doctor, this is, this is, a, this is a very easy question. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of the vaccine? Just a quick <laughs> oh, easy, question. easy question, easy question. So, so easy. you know, if, if you kind of no, see, no, no, sorry, I'll ask. I'll ask. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to stay on top. We got to stay on top. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, by the way, the, the we go that, into that. I mean, this this I, I, will immediately be like, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll, nobody will ever listen past this point. No, so. no, I, 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 <laughs> that. I have to, I have to add, Doctor Riani. Uh, honestly, I still do look up to you, Riani. The what do you call it? The, one of the beautiful things that I really enjoyed reading on Facebook. One of the <laughs> And the nice things was the your documented experiences as a doctor and all the stories you were sharing for a period of time. I, I loved reading those. Those beautiful yeah. experiences, subhanAllah. Yeah. You'd you be surprised how many people you influenced. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for saying that's kind words. Uh, and so and so yeah, so what happened was is I was here for longer I was here. Um, I was able to, for the first time in my life to develop really intimate, strong relationships with non-Muslims around me, right? My my boss being one of them, Michael, Michael Pafford, who will probably listen to this later. So it'll be a good, a, good, a good thing. He was the one who convinced me to come to Arkansas. He was my boss and, and now is my partner in, in the business that we run. Uh, and we became really close, right? I, I love the guy, right? Tr truly from, from my heart. Um, and, and, you know, he grew up Baptist and, 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 um, and it still, still believes and goes to church and those type of things in this community. He's a strongly religious person for, for the most part, I think he would say. Um, and other people around me are various different religiosity levels, right? And, and I happen to be in the South, right? In the Bible Belt. So primarily um, either either religious Christians or um, of different Protestant denominations, right? Um, or, or a few Catholics and, 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 and beyond that as well. And for the first time in my life, this really kind of really oversimplified answer that I'd always grown up with uh, as a Muslim, especially in Islamic school, right? Where, where you're taught uh, pr pretty quickly and, and adamantly that, that um, obviously Islam right? Islam is the truth and that this is the only path um, to, to, to the pleasure of Allah Sa'ada and that and if you want to avoid going to hell, you, you really have to believe in Allah Sa'ada that he's one and that Muhammad Hassan is his messenger and that everybody who dies outside of that context or, you know, has been exposed. And this is an oversimplified version, but this is the, the, the one that I've always been, been fed, obviously, since I was little. And I don't mean fed facetiously. I mean, just have been taught, right? Sincerely. Um, uh, what was was this kind of thought process and all of a sudden I found myself really really struggling right about three or four years ago uh, because I thought as I looked at Michael across our lunch table where we'd eat every lunch together and have some really beautiful conversations that were in-depth and meaningful about our thoughts of the world and the universe and Allah and God right um, was that it was really hard for me to reconcile my simplified uh, understanding um, of 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 that belief, right? That this guy who I love, and, and then many others in my life now that I, that I consider near and dear to me, um, would would be, by my understanding, my simple understanding, be someone that would go to hell based upon based upon my Islamic understanding, um, and that if we both died today, we'd end up in very different places. Assuming, right, that I was a reasonably half good Muslim who believed in Allah Sa'ad and was trying my best and was trying to be sincere, but we'd end up in very different places, um, and that that. That's that's troubled me since. That's just the real. That's me being real, right? Even even till now, right? I've come up with answers, and I've had conversations with Zaid. Right? There was a night when I visited Zaid three or four years ago, and Sheikh Yasser was still in, 
you know, far away from us in New Jersey. And Sheikh Osama was still, you know, kind of starting up his thing. And I speak Clifton and I got Zaid one night because I had a very short time in New Jersey. And I said, I just need to talk to somebody about this because it's, it's, it's hurting. It hurts. It hurts to think that this person that I care about and the many people I care about now um, that I have to kind of somehow find those two answers make sense at the same time. So my first question is, is, is that, it, is that oversimplified belief? Uh, is it, is it, is that is that the is that the party line, right? Is that is that what we're supposed to believe? That's that's the first question. Um, and and is there any room, right? I'm just gonna be real. Is there any room for a belief that says that when I look at this close friend of mine who I love, who would care for me, who I'd allow to be with my family, right? When my back is turned, is the way I describe somebody that you really care about, right? That's, I trust the, the kind of person who, if something bad happened to me, he's the one I would call on the phone, right? And I have, right? There was a pipe burst in my house. I have no idea. I've, hold the, I've never learned how to, it was literally exploding water. And the first person I could think of was this guy because I knew he was going to find a way of helping me and, and he did, right? And so uh, that kind of relationship, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's my first question. Do those things, can they be reconciled, right? Um, and then how are we supposed to do that as, as, as average Muslims living in America surrounded by, by good people, right? Um, that, that are not Muslim. So you're trying to reconcile your love for people that you believe to be genuinely good people with the fact that as far as you understand it, if they, if they continue on their current path, uh, they would end up in Jahannam, in hellfire. Exactly. Yeah. To be concise. Yeah. Uh, pretty no, it's pretty tough left. questions. Right, that's the way I roll. I've been waiting, I've been right into the meat years. of it. Ahmed, there's a there's a just let's go back to the vaccine. This is your first time with us. Yeah. Um, there's an unspoken rule. The person who has the most books in the background answers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, Sheikh Yasser, I was yeah. getting ready to ask questions about he bubbles, has, and uh, that, he went that, right into the meeting. <laughs> I was going to, because he, he mentioned bubbles in the beginning a lot, like the bubble of uh, Mishaarifil. It yeah. seems like there's a lot of bubbles in New Jersey, you know. We're going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna ask him all of our medical questions at the end, but Sheikh Osama, the books are are screaming. And they want to hear. They want to hear what you have to say. Bismillah. Allah <laughs> Fadlaka Mawlana. I I guess uh, there's a lot to unpack. I think all you guys realize this, and that's why we're making it a whole episode. You know, uh, in the question, it's not like one of those types of things that. Uh, you can answer in a minute or five. Um, it's it's not one of those things that uh, can be dealt with in binaries. And, you know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about our tradition. There is room for that nuance. Our, in fact, that's what our whole tradition, Islamic tradition is based on, that nuance. Uh, and, um, you know, um, I, I, for me, like when I think of what you, your question, like, uh, uh, you know, um, immediately what comes to mind is, all right, well, you know, how has Islam inspired me to deal with uh, people from different backgrounds, whether they're within the folds of Islam or outside? That's one part of it, you know, like um, as a means of operating in life, you know, and uh, two, um, you know, how does Islam teach me to really treat the subject of uh, destiny and my, uh, you know, ultimate, uh, uh, I guess, uh, residents uh, when it comes to khulud and eternity um, you know for every single one of us and uh, you know there's a, a big difference between you know speaking about things in the realm of theory and dealing with them uh, through a tangible reality and I think that distinction is you know one thing that hopefully we'll be able to unpack and what we mean by that exactly is um, you know just as every religion there's perhaps certain standards and criteria for what makes a person a Muslim, quote unquote, and what are the consequences of sort of not, um, you know, uh, living up to that standard or that criteria. And then there's another discussion about, okay, when it comes to actual judgment, who has the space to speak about that? Is it anyone other than Allah Azza wa Jal when it comes to actual judgment? One of the names and attributes of Allah, God, is Al-Hakam, Al-Adl, uh, the ultimate judge um the just judge um so i think that's another you know uh you know because you know i have to deal with this just as i would deal with any matter of the unseen um i am extremely limited and purposefully limited from 
at the amount of unseen that I actually have exposure and access to. So, you know, for me, like uh, right now, I'm just thinking of the different talking points, uh, uh, you know, about the subject. Uh, you know, one is how to operate uh, in this dunya, how to view people of differing backgrounds. And two is just like, um, you know, where do I fit in the, you know, our dean teaches us categorically, um, you know, across the board that I really know very little about the unseen realm. Uh, I have guidelines, but I, I really can't even, you know, comfortably say that I am somehow saved. We don't have that doctrine that, uh, you know, I'm saved because I believed in some, because I said a few words or because, you know, and th that's what the Quran exactly says. They said, it's not by your wishful thinking. It's about your behavior, your conduct. So and I don't know what you have to add to that, Sheikh Yasser. I know it's a very vast subject, but, you know, and then the, the last thing I think is, you know, that would need to be reflected upon is the whole concept of problem of evil, because that's what it leads to with the whole uh, subject. Well, okay, if, if people, some people are, um, uh, I mean, sorry, God's punishment and reward, not, not the problem of evil, like, you know, people are going to be punished. Um, well, uh, should the punishment equal the 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 amount of wrongdoing i guess you could say who can really uh set the bar for that you know uh well on i mean i don't know what you have to say Sheikh Yassir, Danny. no barakallah i think that's a that's a good general framing uh of how we can kind of just humble ourselves in this space because you know i think when we when we talk about realm the realm of the afterlife it is a realm that is way well above our pay grade. You know, we are all ignorant of the reality of it, except for that which God has kind of articulated and has conveyed to us. <clears throat> and God has been very explicit about what he expects from us as individuals. And in that regard, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear that his expectations of how we treat one another, how we deal with one another, is, is one of mercy, one of compassion, um, you know, one of bir, la yanhakumullah, Allah does not deprive you with regards to those who do not, you know, uh, attack you or who do not drive you out of your homes, and tabarruhum, wa tuqsitu ilayhim, that you, you, you have a relationship of bir, and a relationship of bir is a very profound relationship. Bir is loosely translated into respect, honor, trust, dignity, care for, protection. Um, and so there is an expectation that with one another um, in, in, sp in spaces, and especially when there's, there's harmony, there's, there's neighborliness, there's, you know, uh, um, there's a peer group, um, there are colleagues, and, and there's, there's a harmonious reality within society that the relationship should be of this type of care and protection and, and love and, and, and worry. I mean, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent as a mercy to all of creation. And, and not, you know, rahma doesn't just mean mercy, it means compassion. And Surah Al-Kahf, uh, the chapter of the cave, clearly illustrates that, you know, the Prophet loved people and cared about people so much that it was almost going to lead to his demise, you know, um, how much he loved people. So I think there's this very huge misconception around this idea, given the uh, what you were fed uh, growing up, Ahmed, um, in that, you know, because we heard or we learned about the reality of heaven and hell, which is a reality, and we learned about the fact that there are certainly people who are destined to heaven and people who are destined to hell. And we learned that there is a pathway that leads you to heaven. If you follow it, then the hope is that you will be led into heaven. And there is a pathway that leads people into hellfire. We somehow in transpose that onto our day-to-day -day reality as if somehow we are in the, we, God wants us to be sitting here negotiating uh, you know, this question as if it's like an operative question in our day-to-day -day affairs. Like, you're smelling a little hellish today, so I'm not sure I can really interact <laughs> with you. Let's not, you know. That, so bringing the afterlife into this life in that way, in terms of mu'amalat, in terms of interactions and dealings, um, doesn't actually hold. Everything we should do for one another, the way we should love, 
care, respect, honor, neighbors of any color, any shape, any size, any creed, it doesn't matter. Um, the, 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 the help, the support, the Prophet ﷺ says that the most beloved of people are though the most beloved of people in the sight of God are those who bring the most benefit to people, and nas. And nas are is mutlaq, it's a, it's an unrestricted category. So all people, you're, you're, how much benefit you bring to people, how much burden you carry uh, and you lift off of people, etc. So I, I think we have clear indications in our tradition that we should we should care deeply about one another. We should love, we should respect. We should choose people in our lives that really you know better who we are um and 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 we can we can have a trust relationship where you give them your keys to your home to help when you're you know not there and so on and so forth with regards to the afterlife what i'll tell you is the following your only concern should be about trying to present this tradition this sacred religion in the most beautiful way Balligh. Your duty, your duty is to convey the sacredness of this tradition, the beauty of this tradition. That is something that we should be doing, not in the Bible, Quran thumping way of like, you know, convert, <laughs> you know, it's more about, let me just, I want to tell you about, you know, my, the tradition that I follow, this religion that I, that I, you know, commit to and, and how beautiful it is. And, and, and I want you to experience its beauty, beauty and see it. And, and yes, I mean, if you come into the space of talking about, you know, destiny and the afterlife, I think it's very reasonable to believe in the fact that, yes, the pathway as understood is that for me to get to heaven or for any person to get to heaven, they have to fully surrender to God in the way that God expects. And in that, in our, in our comprehension of that, that means a belief in God, his prophets, all of his prophets, the last being the prophet Muhammad the afterlife, etc. There's a basic set of theological precepts required for that salvation. Who's going to be saved and how and who exactly and precisely? Yeah. What we know with certainty, and I'll close with this, is that God does not wrong anyone. Right? There's no wrong on this. No one will be wrong. No one will be oppressed. No one, like, you know, we have to be careful about and I'll use this term very cautiously, um, what I call false sympathy. Um, by that, I mean, it's like, but, 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 but he's my best friend. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I don't, it's not that, it's not that, that it's not genuine, but that's not, it's almost, I want to say politely, it's none of your business. Like on the day of judgment, that's God. I mean, that's all God's reality. You know, no one's going to be, <clears throat> if, it, you know, it's, a, it's remarkable that on that day, you're going to literally be running away from your own children. Are, you're not going to care about your kids on that day. You're not going to care about your wife. You're not going to care about your mother, right? Uh, I mean, the prophets themselves overwhelmingly will say, hey, listen, leave me alone. <laughs> go, to the, go to the one of the other guys. I can't, I have my stuff that I have to negotiate today. So, your love, in my opinion, should manifest in this life through how you treat people, but what you care for them to know, what you care for them to, 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 to conceive of. You know, and if I love people as a Muslim, I will, want, I will love for them to know the beauty of Islam. And I would love for them that they're exposed to this in a way where they can consider it for themselves. I would love that, right? And, and that's the type of that's the type of pluralism, and I want to talk a little bit about this, but I'll, I'll pause here. That's the type of pluralism that I think our society should consider, because I think a lot of our challenges around theology and the afterlife and harmonizing between nations and peoples and different uh, faith groups, etc., you know, it's, 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 it's bred out of a particular philosophical episteme that exists, but I'll, 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 I'll you know, cover that in another maybe diatribe. Uh, so, so I think, I think you hit on the, the major points that I, I, I want to say, but I want to take a couple of things that I've heard both of you say um, and, and tell you kind of some of my thoughts that popped up while, while you were speaking, you know, <clears throat> I think, I think one thing that I, um, I see as kind of a struggle for, for myself, right. Is that when, 
uh, I have to, I, you know, again, right? Like I don't see into people's hearts. I have no idea. Well, I can only see what people allow me to see of them, right? And that's that's just that's that's what it is. Um, but but when I see many people, right? So you know, the religiosity in the Northeast is very different than religi religiosity in the South. It's, it's quite clear, right? There's there's a difference in the way people talk about their faith in the South. There's it's it's beautiful. Like there's it's different, right? In the Northeast, to give you an example. If I'm talking to a family member in the hospital about somebody who's dying, uh, I can't bring up religion because I don't know how they'll take it, right? In the South, if I don't bring up religion, they look like I'm crazy, right? I, you know, I can say things in the South like this, God has a plan that we don't always understand. I can say those type of things and there's an immediate connection um, and a comfort immediately between me and those people, uh, especially when they've kind of opened themselves up in a vulnerable time, right? Uh, and, and trust me as their, as their doctor. Uh, and similarly, right, when I speak to people who, who like these aren't people who are uh, are, are um, not thinking deeply right about their relationship with God and their position on earth and their let you know I think me and Michael talk about legacy and what we do on this earth and the way we impact people that that's so much of what we talk about right um, human interaction and, and the principles that we want to stand by and so on and so forth this this guy and so many others right uh, he's just the guy that happens to be close to me There's obviously many are constantly in thought about these things that that obviously appear uh, very, very, very sincere for, from my perspective. And again, I don't pretend, it sounds arrogant if I say that in comparison to Allah I know is I don't mean to make that comparison, but but I am a human being who lives on the earth given certain utilities by Allah to, to, to make reasonable judgments about people who are in front of me, right? Uh, and and I had this, this, it's a problem in my heart perhaps, but it's a problem that I have to deal with where it's, these people are trying as hard as they can, right? To seem to look for an answer. And many of them just by, the sun of this existence will die not having become overtly Muslim in 2021 when it's not an excuse, you know, oh, before the Prophet ﷺ existed, there wasn't an Islam per se, but there was this Tawheed. I'm talking about 2021, the people who I take care of for in the hospital, right? The, the little old lady's hand who's dying of COVID who asked me to pray for her, right? Is looking to God in that moment. She does not, she believes in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? It's a very different dynamic, right? But she, this is what she believes is the answer at this point in time, right before she dies. And she's looking to Allah from my perspective, even though she may, you know, have a terminology that's very, very different from our lexicon and she dies there. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I think have, is there a certain level of cognitive dissonance that I have to allow myself to have to say this person who I cared about in this short time, uh, I have to accept at the end of the day, uh, based again upon the conclusion. Now, now I'm not talking about, the unknown this is something verbally that she said before she dies or he dies mm -hmm. uh how do i reconcile what my belief system says about what yeah. will happen to somebody in this context and and my obligation like the sheikh, sheikh said right of caring for them as if you know the way that i try to because i think that's what models from house's behavior um yeah I, I don't know i guess the immediate thought that comes to my mind uh, uh dr ahmed uh, about this is uh uh, you know, there's no like um, uh, cookie cutter answer that fits all different types of situations, even in 2021, 2022, about this type of issue. Actually, you'd be interested to know that the scholars actually examined um, the possibilities of how someone maybe again, maybe because it's from the unseen realm judged if they do receive the message, but it was distorted in a way that made its original form, its pure, the purity of its guidance unattainable for that person in a way. It's actually like there's Fox, actually Fox books <laughs> just like filtered Islam for all perhaps, perhaps. And actually, a lot of this stuff is debatable. It's not like clear cut things. Like there's books written by some of the scholars of Imam Ghazali and others about the concept of man balagatu da'wa mushawaha. Does that apply or not apply? You'll find differing views. Um, you know, among scholars, even today, it's not, you know, like, that's not to say our dean, our religion doesn't give us clear guidance about, um, you know, uh, what's right and what's wrong, uh, per se, about what's uh, accepted and what's rejected, about the consequences of disbelief, but does that apply to uh, this person or not? That's something, you know, um, I really can't say for certainty, even if I see someone saying certain words uh, that I would perceive as words of disbelief at the moment of their death, I really do not know the variable. There's just like um, an endless amount of, but there is one thing though, uh, in terms of amal and actions, 
I need to stop at a certain point. Like I need to, uh, our religion teaches us to deal with things as they appear uh, and to leave the ultimate affair to Allah Azza wa Even when it comes to my own personal behavior, by the way, this whole idea of husn al-khatima, Muslims believe in it, uh, you know, um, and surrender to it wholeheartedly, this idea of coveting uh, a beautiful end to your life and that being indicative of some uh, some your status by god like I, I right now i don't i don't know what will the end of my life be uh and the one that our prophet says uh, uh, you know actions are by how they end or lives are how they end and you know so i i think like in this types of in terms of amal yeah i won't perhaps make a prayer make um uh you won't pray prayer. Jenazah on them. You won't. You won't I won't do the gen- the exactly. Yeah. yeah, I won't do the rituals, the Islamic rituals, uh, to someone who I, as they appear, uh, have not realized that they've accepted Islam. But at the same time, you know, I don't know their ultimate destination. I, I really can't say that, you know, because even in this reality, it, it, you know, there's just too many variables to speak. For. And you know what? There's, there's, it's, it's a useless thing, you know, uh, you know, and you know, shaitan uh, is a, is a master at getting us caught up in useless things, you know, like the shaitan wants to, you know, uh, I guess, remove us from the realm of action and get us caught up in the realm of theory. And it's a, it's a really big problem that we face, you know, at the end of the day, what am I going to get out of saying, uh, so person, a person B or, or C is going to be here, um, or there when it comes to the eternal life. I have the guidelines and uh, that should be sufficient for me. If, if I can clarify though, before Sheikh Hansi, you, you, you jump in, I, I think uh, okay for the answer. I, so so r- ritual, the ritual aspect I think is not the part that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about in this in this framework of this question of caring people, caring for people in, 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 you know, in a very vulnerable time. I, I'm thinking about the disconnect I would have to allow myself to have, right? To, to, to function reasonably. And this is again, probably more with me in my chest than anybody else, but just the problem I will continue to have until I figure it out is, is um, you know, I want to help people because this is everything that I understand my religion to mean and to do, be, to be, right? Be compassionate, hold that hand and be there and say nice words to try to soften this, this miserable end for somebody who's suffering and so on and so forth. Um, and, and for the, their families that are around, right? That I'm, that I'm hugging and trying to console, right? In this, in this moment and, and saying, very general things, right? Things like, you know, look, like, you know, he or she is with, with God now, right? I can say some really general things that I think everybody can accept that I feel like isn't isn't um, contradictory, right? To, to, to my belief system, but inside now, now I'm talking about the externalities and talking like internally though, right? Uh, this will continue to happen day to day to day because it's what I do for a living or, or even with my neighbors or whatever. Um, I, I want to care for them in a way that's consistent with my understanding of them being deserving of the mercy of Allah. That's a really complicated thing, I know. And I'm not trying to say I know what who's deserving of the mercy of Allah, but I'm saying from that really basic, simplified understanding of who's a kafir, right? Who's, a, who's an unbeliever, who, who's heard of Islam and, you know, has heard, you know, whatever, right? In, in some respect and, and has denied it. I said, I, I reject this thing. It's wrong. I believe in this belief system. And it's made them a superficially from my eyes, a good person, right? It's made them treat their family right and treat their neighbors right. And they go to charity and they try to go to their, to their religious worship every Sunday and they try their best in the way, um, you know, that, that I, at least I can see from them. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of more of my question uh, is how, how do you reconcile that? In, sure, externally, it feels insincere is what I kind of mean to say, right? Is it insincere in me then? Do, do I have this thing inside my chest? Yeah, I mean, I can take care of you, but but you know, we know, right? You know, like, <laughs> no. sorry, buddy. Like, I'll hold your hand. This is t- life's tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, honestly. So, what strikes me, Ahmed, is that you know, I think if we if we take a step back and we actually look at where we fall on the totem pole of just existence, we'll realize that we are so you know insignificant as a being, right? You know, you talk about caring for people and serving people and giving people and uh, remedying people, etc. At the end of the day, you are, you, I, all of us, we are very simple, inconsequential beings who are just trying to do some degree of good, be genuine believers, so that God is pleased with us. That's really my identity as a human being. 
I think this idea that somehow like making the distinction or the, 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 hip, the, the idea of there being a dissonance or some hypocrisy is because you're viewing, I think, people, we've, we tend to view our actions and how we deal with people as being like, you know, okay, well, I have to negotiate the fact that you have a destiny in an afterlife it's potential that it's there. So it kind of makes me question how much I should be giving to you in this life. That whole equation is faulty. It's not your duty other than to be a person who gives, gives generously, gives the, from the fullness of your heart, serves, helps, and conveys to the best of your ability. As a humble, inconsequential servant, who's just trying to be looked at by God as a pleasing servant. I think that helps us reconcile the fact that if, because if, if I'm not, if I'm always disposed in a way where God is so magnificently large and profound and present in every equation, and he's overseeing every reality that he's the God of this life and the afterlife, you know, that and, and he's observant and we're all just these humble servants just trying to kind of for God to look at us because he is ever watchful that he's he's pleased by us I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit there and thinking well you know should I treat you well because I don't know philosophically I have a problem no no it's just gonna be I'm gonna treat well because Allah's watching and I have to do good and I want God to be pleased with me and I'm not I'm not involved in that and I think this is what Sheikh Usama was indicating about how Sometimes we, we, we get busied in questions. And it, by the way, what you're saying is, I think, a very profound uh, reality. Like many people, I think, struggle with this issue. You know, I, I have a, I, people have come to me time and time again. I have a best friend. This is person has been with me from day one. They're wonderful. They, they're more, you know, they're more loving and caring of me than my own siblings. I'm like, alhamdulillah, that's a beautiful thing. What's the problem? Well, you know, the afterlife, I'm like, yeah, just leave it up to Allah. He'll take care of that. <laughs> you know, my duty, because it's like, I have, you know, let me just flip the switch for a second. Okay. I know with certainty person X is going to hellfire. Let's just say for argument's sake. What does that mean? Effectively, what does that mean? I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to care about them. I'm still going to serve them. I'm still going to call them to the beauty of Islam. I'm still going to want to illustrate how, and I'm going to even make the dua of the prophets. Allahumma hadi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people. They don't know. You know, you see the compassion of the prophets for their people, their love. Ya qawmi, ya qawmi, my people, my people. It was always articulations of love. You know, Sayyidina Nuh loved his people. He, you know, he worried about them. And la ya'jizun. In Allah may di qawmi fa innahum la ya'jizun. They don't. They're, they don't get how significant you are, Allah. They don't understand this reality the way that you want them to understand it. You know, uh, there are people who, who may be Christians and that we, we care for deeply and we have harmony and we have birr with them. Um, but we, I, I, I really want my fellow brethren to know about the Prophet Muhammad, right? From a place of love, not from a place of evangelism. Like I'm not a Muslim evangelist, you know? I want people to learn about the beauty of the prophet from a space of balagh, conveyance, and also from a place of compassion and love, right? And, and, and I pray that people, you know, accept the beauty of Islam for what it is, which is the final, finality of the divine, the, the, the divine message through prophecy. I think that, you know, when, when we then think of this life and the afterlife, we have to put it within the same simple rubric of there is one God, the God of the heavens and the earth, the God who is manifest, he's magnificent, he's ever watchful, ever present, he's, he, and, and he sees and he's watching, do because God verily sees what you do. And that way we can just humble, not to say that it's coming from arrogance, just humble the fact that I don't, you know, my, my, what you are being sincerely genuine when you tell someone, listen, you know, I, my heart is there for you. That yes, your husband, your father, your child is with God. 
That is a very beautiful, sincere, genuine statement, all right? That what I know from about my Allah, my God, is that he is al-mulku yawma idhin al-haqqu lil-rahman. You know, that dominion on this day, the day of judgment, belongs to the most merciful, right? So I know he's in the hands of the most merciful. What God will then adjudicate is simply in our, not even in our realm of like, you know, for us to, to, to let our minds wander. Other than to say, Ya Rabbi, you are, you know, anta, you know, you are the Lord of all of us. And you are the Lord of this humble servant that you have taken, right? And, and, and you can speak even in that context about the goodness of this person. You can testify to that. You can, you know, you can speak about the goodness of what you saw from this person as a humble observant to a reality around you that you don't understand. That's far bigger than you. All you're trying to do is follow the directives as conveyed to you as you understood it. And that's all you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay, can I can I ask you a question based upon the last portion of what Please. you said? Yeah. So so the the truth is I, the <laughs> the the confession from my my heart about this issue is is uh 50, 50 hail marys please it's, yeah I know right it's 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 a little it's a little bit it's that was a joke also it's I know it's also <laughs> it's also a little bit uh, uh it's it's equally as <laughs> just troubling, right? the parts of the community here that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that one get it up on YouTube Sheikh he has to give that me was that was a joke, my brothers and sisters. Uh, that may have been a little bit of my Catholic school uh, upbringing. That, 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 that's going to be clicked, uh, clipped from the video. Yeah, Sheikh Yasser, that's going to be made. Oh, no, no. The, listen, <laughs> something you don't understand about the online, online realm, very compassionate place. Yeah. Very, very open minded. <laughs> Best people. Very nuanced and understanding. Yeah. Very nuanced. <laughs> understand sarcasm and joking. You know? So, so, so the, the struggle is, is that, um, is that I, my, often the way that I've handled this, uh, <laughs> because it makes me feel better, uh, and, and no, that's not a good reason to do, do things all the time, is, is to, is to, at this point, feel or believe or whatever that um, that my understanding of Allah Taala is that is that this is all going to end well for these people, right? That I have, I almost have to believe, feel that way, right, in my interaction. Uh, and I believe it to a certain extent, right? In in my heart, that just because Allah Taala defines this stuff as merciful and all the things that you've said to this point, uh, you know, th and this is just the truth, right? Like in the conclusion of that, for me, is often I don't have the struggle in telling people those things because I almost have to believe it. I have to believe as I'm watching this person suffer with the people around them that love them and say all the good things about them that they've done in their lives. That if this person has done these good things, then the Lord that I believe in, right, the Allah that I believe in. Uh, you know, the conclusion for this person, though, I may not understand the exact destination and all the, I don't know, the time and the punishment. I don't know any of that stuff, right? Because it's all in the, in the unknown and unseen. But I have to assume that their, that their ultimate end, the, the eternity that Sheikh Osama talked about, right? That just infinite eternity endpoint of all this, uh, you know, it's got, it's got to be good, right? It's got to be enveloped in mercy. No, it's but I think, I, think your, I think your challenge is that you have a conception of mercy that somehow presupposes that you know better about what mercy looks like. Mm. And I think that's where you're, you're mistaken. And we're all mistaken because we do, it's, we, we are, we're, you know, we're, as human beings, we are inherently weak, you know? So there is a, there is a, there is a fragility to our hearts and how we feel. Some people, maybe their hearts become hardened, there's plenty of people who are like, I don't give a damn where anyone goes. I don't care if you go to hell, like whatever. But there are plenty of others who come from a place of compassion and love and whose hearts are, as the Egyptians say, tari. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a gentle, gentle soul who, you know, who, who feel that, you know, they, that's why I said this overextension, like you're, you're overreaching in your conception of mercy. No, God's, God is the fullness of what mercy can ever be conceived of. Like we have traditions that tell us, prophetic traditions that, you know, God sends 99 mercies. I'm sorry, God sends one mercy to this Hayatul Dunya and he preserves 99 mercies for the afterlife. What that even means, Allahu A'lam, but all that we know is that God is the possessor of mercy, possessor of compassion. 
he is the standard bearer of that reality. So I may have, you know, there's some times where you have to, like something just happened between my kids and I had to punish my daughter. And my son, he's a, he's a very gentle soul. And so he's like, uh, he can't handle it. He's just like struggling. Uh, Baba, uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, he's a, he runs upstairs to, to like draw something for her to make her feel better. Although she is like right now a criminal, like straight up criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Justice must be served. <laughs> must divert her from the path. Of, of destruction that she is on. So from mercy and compassion is I have to put her in time out. I have to make sure she understands that what she did is very problematic, very dangerous. It actually comes from love. It comes from care. It comes from concern of her. <laughs> My son does not understand that. It's hard for him to conceive. All he sees is Baba like this, and he sees his sister like this. And so in his mind, it's like, no, 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 no. There is an obvious, more compassionate thing here. Just love her. Forgive her. It's okay, Baba. It's okay. You know, give her whatever she wants. No, that's not, that's not what it is. That's not, you, you don't conceive of it from where I conceive, conceive of it as your superior, you know, a father who knows more, who sees more, etc. Um, and and if, if that's the distinction between us and our children, then what about the distinction between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's like infinitely more, uh, you know, a, a, an infinite greater disparity. So I, I just, I feel like it's not that you have to believe that they're going to be okay, meaning that like, you know, they're going to be in the gardens of, no, you, what you have to believe if you're going to use that language is that God does not wrong anyone. And that's it. What that looks like, yeah. don't let your mind go there because you just, it's so above your pay grade yeah, that it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's futile to even let your mind go there. What you know with certainty is that he is the most merciful and that his mercy will be manifest. No one will be wronged, right? We may, from our simple subjective conception of mercy, perceive it to be, well, okay, so that means they're going to be in heaven and we're going to be all together in the Firdaus. No, that's none of my business. Like, you know, we, your, your duty is to like pray that Allah grants you the highest levels and that your family and your loved one and guides humanity into that space, you know, and that we all are together in the afterlife. But there is a pathway that we have been taught because it's not, it's not my deen, it's Allah's. You know, Islam is the path. And those who, who seek and desire other than this path of submission to Allah as brought to us by the Prophet will not be accepted. That's a Quranic truth. Yeah. From love, I have to convey this truth to people. I have to say, hey guys, you know, the revelation from God are, says the following. Please consider it. Look into it. You know, that's my, my love and care for you. So I don't, I, I hope what's clear is that putting, putting myself into my prop in the proper scale and, and understanding that my mercy will never even remotely register in the, in, in, in the presence of God's mercy mm -hmm. and that his mercy is, 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 is vast and endless and mine is profoundly limited. You know, we have a very limited conception of mercy and we're just negotiating one mercy, yeah. you know, out of the endless mercy that will be present in the afterlife. Yeah, I guess, you know, to add to that, uh, you know, I, I really like, uh, uh, you know, you know, want to emphasize that I can't really say that assumption of myself or another Muslim for certainty either you know there's no there's no speaking about the akhirah in certain terms whether the pers person dies as a muslim or not you know and i think that's important to realize because even if that person who was in your hands was a muslim you would have certain hopes and prayers uh but ultimately you would surrender to uh the merciful the just allah azza wa jal um and you know i zakla khair sheikh yasif for bringing that other side of the equation i think like you know, have how I've been perceiving the discussion going as balancing between two extremes. You know, on one end, uh, reducing the subject to, uh, you know, a very simplistic approach that sort of is weaponized by someone who believes 
arrogantly that they can speak about things that are exclusive to God very easily and loosely. And on the other end, uh, it's realizing that our religion really hasn't completely left us in the dark. It's not like I just like, I don't know completely. No, there's clear guidance, as Sheikh Yasser said, about the guidelines, the criteria um, uh, that um, whoever seeks other than Islam as a religion, as a standard, um, it will not be accepted. And you know how that applies in detail. That's you know this is actually something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually dealt with and addressed. There was a man among the Arab. Uh, he was very very generous. Is known for his karam as Hatim al Ta'i, and um, uh, his son approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Adib bin Hatim, and he said, oh, "My father used to." fortify ties of kin and my father used to do all kinds of uh, uh, acts of goodness and the prophet وسلم, uh, said to him your father sought something and he attained it um, and what the prophet وسلم, saying by that is you know when it comes to the realm of justice when someone does an inkling of good it's not going to go completely in vain but if they do it with the right intentions uh, it's benefit will extend beyond the confines of this world the conceptualization of sin is something you know when we talk about sin people today perceive it as okay that's something where there's aggression oppression you're doing something to hurt someone else but in our islamic conceptualization of it that, that's not really the reality uh, if if i want to have that understanding i'm going to need to cancel out a whole lot of verses of the quran uh, like when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, um um uh, um, uh, the in Allah, Allah does not forgive, forgive making an associate with Him. That's considered an act of sinfulness in, in our tradition and in, in the Quran, the, the words of the Quran itself. Um, you know, I, so I think you know th that's how I see this discussion balancing out. Where do I fit between uh, the reality of the seen and unseen and these two extremes? Allah, I mean. I did, I did want to ask uh, Ahmed, um, you know, do you, so I, I think there are plenty of people, so I'm just going to speak for myself, I know you, I've known you for a very long time, right, if someone was to ask me about Ahmed, I would, I would say good things about you, right, I don't, I don't know bad things about you, right, um, uh, would it, like, do you feel now, do you as a person, like, so you, you have left that impression on a lot of people, including the three people on this, in this conversation. Do you then assume that you must be in Jannah with God completely, like, free of all sin and blame about no, yourself? No, no, of course, of course not. No, like, I, you know, I think, yeah, sorry, finish your point. No, yeah, no, but so, so like, my, my point being, like, if, if you don't hold that belief about yourself, I, like, I, I don't see why we have to then extend that same that that belief to other people. So if if people think well of me, I know my own faults. Like I may have fooled all of these people. Like all three of you may. Uh, Sheikh Yasser tells me all the time I'm the worst person on earth. But other than oh, that, no, no, right? <laughs> there's one or two worse. There's one. Or two. <laughs> other than that, you know, you two might think I'm good, but maybe I fooled you guys, right? Like, and, and I know my own shortcomings. I know my own evils. I know my own. Like intentionality, or I know my own daily struggles and daily like it wouldn't shock me for a moment if I haven't earned God's mercy because I know my own sh you know, shortcomings. So I, I don't know why I have to then extend something different to other people, right? Just like I'm struggling, everybody else, I'm just as human as everybody else here. All right. So that that was the first uh, sort of analogy I wanted to I wanted to draw out for you. The second one I think actually Sheikh Yasser. Um, in his response, I think got it pretty right. Like it, it just seemed like over and over again we were getting into this realm where um, your, as much as you seem to admit your limited knowledge, you still want to insist on it being true. I really want that. Yeah. Yeah, and like <laughs> it's true. I, I think I, it's true. I, yeah, yeah, I I do want to I do want to also say this. I actually think it's a beautiful thing. I, I think it's a very beautiful thing. And it is a sign of true love for people that you want them to be in heaven. Like, I, I don't, like, that's a natural extension of love, right? It doesn't mean that they get it because you love it for them, 
but that's a, like, I, I, like, I'm not getting the dissonance is what I'm trying to get at, right? So if I genuinely love someone, I genuinely want them to be in Jannah. I don't see why my love for them to be somewhere good means that they have to get it. Like, I don't, I'm not getting that jump. That jump doesn't, it's not registering with me. Mm. Um, and, and then the third thing I'll ask, and I don't know if this analogy is going to be good, but I do want to ask it back to you, right? Because I know you, and I'm sure you've dealt with a whole bunch of, for example, like COVID deniers or anti-vaxxers given where you are in the country, right? Um, I'm pretty sure you loved a lot of people and cared for a lot of people who you knew if this person just listened to the advice that we had given him a few months ago, he or she may not be struggling right now, yeah. right? You may still, with every part of your heart, want them to recover. But you know, if they, because they didn't listen to what we know is medically correct, they're most likely not going to recover. Mm. And no amount of well-wishing is going to change the fact that medically speaking, they're probably done for, right? So, and I understand from what I know of you, that, like, that understanding holds true for you. Like, I love you to death. I want it. Hopefully all of the medicine is wrong and you somehow come out of this well. Yeah. But if you're to ask me, you're not coming out of this well because you didn't follow the medical advice. So why don't we, like, I'm, I'm, the question I have for you is why doesn't that same sort of love and logic extend to this realm, like to this part of your thinking? I think it's a really good. So just speaking out loud about why maybe, maybe I, uh, maybe I have the struggle to begin with, but I, I think the answers obviously answer a lot of the stuff I've said, but I think, you know, I think the, the internal problem is going to be one where I have to figure out how, you know, the COVID, the COVID example is a pretty good example, right? Um, but the difference is the finality of, of this, of this error in judgment, right? This is huge. So yeah, you know, like as Muslims and, you know, if I make a dumb mistake, if I drive on the phone, uh, you know, I look at my phone, that's a bad thing to do and, and even illegal. Right. And I look at my phone and I get in a car accident and I die. That's a bad mistake. Uh, but you know, it was a, it was an error in judgment that lasted a couple of seconds. Hopefully one of which does not result in my ultimate, damnation into hellfire for eternity there's just there's a big difference between that mistake even the covid I, you know I, again right i don't know what sin is bigger i but you know those, those people that that don't believe in covid they really don't believe they really don't believe you can man they're not lying like right you can show them the picture i mean they will see their spouse dying in bed right and and not wear a mask right and, and in that room in that room right so i'm not gonna get into mass arguments but i mean specifically in that room uh you know they, they won't right and so they, they believe, and maybe this is like the, a bigger thing. It actually may even make a harder argument for me because those, I know that I can't convince some people, right? They've been, they've been given something I can't convince them uh, and they mean well. Like those people, most of the COVID vaccine deniers or, or whatever, whatever, right? Like after you get over like the whole hubbub of picking a political side and all other stuff and you actually just sit down and eat, drink coffee with them. Right? They're just normal people. They just have a strong view on this specific thing because they've been given information that makes them conclude this and whatever preconceived kind of, prejudicial biases they have based upon where that data comes from like they're still sincere about that and they'll tell you they'll say no you got you know you have to use the the, the large dose of ivermectin the vitamin c and this is all just you know <laughs> you've been funded by all that stuff right so like the difference between that mistake and this one i, I think we're we're taught and even use it right like you know me my my inclination based on my understanding of being a good person right based on the things that you guys have taught me about Islam is, is I should give people an excuse, right? Like, you know, like there's an excuse there. They just must not, there's something up with their history or their understanding or the way their brain works that makes it really hard for them to get here, right? But when it comes to the biggest question that that judgment error, right? That occurs uh, from, again, superficially appearing sincere people seeking truth, it seems at the very least, right? Uh, you know, or, 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 or the person who's, who's, truth is very limited because they, they live in, you know, Benton, Arkansas, before Yusuf got here, never saw a Muslim in their life. Their only view was Fox News, all that other stuff, right? Uh, and, and, and they're trying hard to read the Bible and figure out the answers for themselves. And they come to this conclusion very, very logically, reasonably, because it's the only path they've, they've had to follow. Um, this is the only answer they received. Can I, right? I'm going to take this to ask a question instead of me just telling and rambling. Can, can I feel, right? This is, I'm asking you a impossible question to answer. Is it a weakness in my faith, right, to, to, to think, right, that, that, um, that God give, may, may give different answers to different people, right? 
is, is that when somebody's seeking a sincere answer, right? Uh, I was telling Zay, there's that whole entire, you know, perennialist Buddhist thought about, you know, there's, there's many, there's many ways to the top of the mountain, I think is, is kind of the paraphrased version of the statement, right? Is it possible that a seeker of truth, right, uh, that, that is trying their best sincerely and genuinely with, with all the human flaws that we all have, right, including, including the many flaws that I have myself, that the conclusion of that, the answer they receive, if it's not Islam, could still be from Allah. Is that a is that a fault? Is that a problem with the way that I think about this world? If if that's a belief that I have, I just want to recap what you said. So the, the yeah. question that you got to at the end is: is it is it against our belief system to believe that Allah guided someone to something other than Islam, and that that's that's their correct guidance? Like that Allah guided a person to Christianity or to Judaism or to Buddhism. And that's their correct guidance because that's the situation they were put in. That, that's the question you're asking. And not, maybe, not that they'll be forgiven ultimately, but that it's actually correct. In, in Between them and Allah, that's the actual correct path. Yeah, right. So, so like, you know, in this, in this vast understanding, Allah thought this is going to be really... I don't mean to get like Elon Musky, but with like we're all living in a in interpersonal relationship. Every one of us has a relationship outside that it's real, right? Like Allah in his vastness can have an, you know, is the one guiding every one of our individual lives, no matter how insignificant we are, right? He's he's he's, he's written our path in some capacity in our interaction and all that stuff, right? That that the conclusion of somebody seeking sincere truth, uh, and m- maybe we separate out, you know, monotheistic religions from other religions. I don't know the answer to that question, right? Because then it gets really, really weird. But like let's say they come to some conclusion that makes them submit to a higher power Allah God right in, in some capacity and then I sit here as a, as a Muslim from far away who, who's doing my best to, to interact with the people around me in a meaningful way like like the sheikhs have said is it a weakness in my faith to think that maybe right and if it's even a possibility that the conclusion of their path when they were seeking truth concludes in a way that's different than mine but that but that they're still going to be okay Right, like to put it really, really fluffy. Because I'm. Well, fluffy. let me. I mean, I, I think then uh, <laughs> Zay's last analogy is pretty operative here. Like you, like let's say you had. I just don't want to use COVID too much because of how politicized it is, right? But let's say you had very distinct, scientific, conclusive knowledge about the right remedy for a particular problem, disease, or whatever. Your, 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 your conception or your sympathy or your care is not going to manifest the way that it's manifesting in this regard. Like you will see, like there are people who are really genuine and sincere out there who believe in something that's just categorically false. Like with all due respect to them and their sincerity and their belief system and their pursuits, it's just false. And, and that's something that's conceivable in this life, you know, when it comes to uh, anything you know any med- the medical space the scientific space the uh, mathematical space just like there's there there are what we would consider to be truths and falsehoods and there are many people who sincerely and genuinely have exhausted themselves they literally watched every you know uh, alex jones <laughs> you know episode or whatever the case is like downloaded all the manifestos and they they believe with absolute sincerity this reality but you will it will not change the truth that you know and it it won't compel you to say well what they believe is also true you don't understand so if that's the case in this realm then once again i don't see the need to you know to to uh, from a place of compassion and mercy quote unquote, that, you know, let their beliefs also be good, you know, let their sincere pursuits also be kind of viable in this space. You know, this is my path, follow it. Don't follow the other pathways because there's multiple other potential iterations of what could be so that don't follow any of those other pathways so that it would lead you astray from the path of God, right? So God is very explicit. This is the deen, right? 
you, uh, we are commanded by Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, to do what? You know, قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهِ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ Obey Allah and obey his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, and the list goes on where the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very explicit about there are believers and there are those who disbelieve, right? There are the categories of the believer and the categories of the kuffar. And kuffar, people, you know, <laughs> people, unfortunately, they think kafir is like a curse. Like you curse me. No, kafir is actually a classification. <laughs> you, if you believe in something, you believe in it. If you don't believe in it, then you're a kafir. <laughs> it's fine. Like it's not, you know, I'm not trying, I'm not giving you, you know, the middle finger. I'm telling you, like, this is your classification. This became a big controversy in Egypt, by the way, uh, where uh, there's a lot of, you know, discourse that wants to like, you know, it's called al-mu'ayisha or ta'ayush. Let's just, you know, a civilized coexistence, mm -hmm. a type of pluralism where we're all, you know, brothers and sisters in, uh, you know, in the, in the nation, you know, the brotherhood of nations. Um, and so there was a sheikh who was on TV and he was just giving a side example. He was saying, et cetera, et cetera, even, he says, even the kuffar, for example, they say X. And so the interview says, sheikh, 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 stop. How could you call them kuffar? And he's like, because they're kuffar. <laughs> they, they don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad. They're a kafir. It's like, a'udhu billah, sheikh. How could you say that? You know? And they got, it became, this became a huge controversy in Egypt. Like literally, uh, you know, years on end where there's this controversy around, you know, can you call a Christian a kafir, a Jew a kafir? You know, uh, and no, it's like... The first, sheikh, yes, right? Hmm? The verse, kufr and taghut in the false deity. If you disbelieve in false deities, it's, it's referred it's to as kufr. Yeah, it's exactly. kufr yeah. yeah. So it's a, a rejection of a belief or a lack of acceptance of a belief is kufr. It's not accepting of that reality. Now, that that's just these are categories. The reason I'm illustrating this is to indicate that you know we don't need to you know dilute the airwaves and the space and the truths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, you know, clearly revealed. One of the names of the Quran is Al-Furqan. You know, the Furqan is that which distinguishes between truth and falsehood. There's a, the Quran affirms the conception of belief and disbelief, Iman and Kufr, affirms the belief or the conception of truth and falsehood. Of 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 vulumat wa nur, of multitudes of darkness and misguidance and light, etc. And the Quran is you know very generous in this regard. So I think that we need to we need to learn you know as an extension of what I was saying earlier that and, and this and, and I also want to challenge with what I'm about to say this idea of what does it really mean to love someone because you know when I say you know, I really love this person and I want to see them in heaven. Well, great. What are you doing about it in the capacity that you have to hopefully ensure that they're in heaven? You know what I mean? Like if I really love this person and we really love, I mean, listen, Ahmed, even with me, you know, you'll say, Sheikh, I love you. Like in our private conversations about medical stuff, you'll say, Sheikh, I love you. And not to like hurt your feelings, but I need to tell you something. And you'll tell me something that's uncomfortable. <laughs> but from a place of love, as a medical professional, and as someone who, you, you know, you have a deep affinity for me, I have a deep affinity for you, you're going to, you know, make me potentially uncomfortable, or, you know, destabilize the space a little bit by like, throwing in something that's going to make you know, make the mood not just all merriment and, and, and joy. But it comes from love. Like, you know something so viscerally. It's like, you have to know this. Yeah. And I think we, we as a community, as a Muslim community in the West, we have to be careful of falling into the narratives of modern pluralism, which wants to dilute the waters. No, truth is truth. Falsehood is falsehood. Belief is belief. Disbelief is disbelief. But love, love is love. And the manifestation of love that I believe in is that I do want to convey this message, right? 
I want to convey the beauty of this message to Al-Alameen, because the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a mercy and compassion to all of the worlds. That's how my love manifests. My love doesn't just manifest in, hope in hopes and dreams and like real big wants in my heart. It actually manifests in how I, what, what, like what is the nature of my relationship? Like Ahmed, you know, before even talking about Muslims and non-Muslims, we can talk about our own family members. Like we all have family members that are a little far away from the path, right? Not to say, not, this is not a question of I am more pious than you. Allah, I have more taqwa than you. Wallahi, I have more taqwa. No, I'm not. <laughs> By the way, I was, I was told that a few times. I'm a sheikh. I'm a sheikh. Sheikh, sheikh. Okay, sheikh. Wallahi, wallahi, I have more taqwa than you. You can't judge me. You can't judge me. <laughs> like, inshallah, you do. <laughs> ya Rabbi, may Allah grant us all taqwa. Taqwa means God consciousness. Um, but but the, the point is that we have family members and loved ones that we, 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 we you know, that are from our, our own blood that we, we worry about and we care deeply about. And we're concerned about the fact, for example, they don't pray, they don't fast, they're, they, they're, they have a long term relationship with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, they do drugs, they drink alcohol. Like we, 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 worry, we worry. My worry for them is not just going to manifest in my heart, it's going to manifest in some practical guidance. Like, can I give you nasiha from my heart? I'm going to, from I'm a place of love, I have to tell you that what you're doing is, is really going to harm you, right? And I'm worried about you. You may, yes, receive in response, who do you think you are? What are you trying? What are you going to judge me? You think you're better than me? There may be a response like that, but you're going to risk it from a place of deep love. So I think as a community, when we look at prophetic love, the prophetic love was never a fear of speaking the truth was never it's like come forth with that which you were commanded you know don't 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 mince words don't don't be wishy-washy don't hide the truth pluralism is not about just you know amicable you know the, an amicable space where it's just like it's nice and comfortable yeah i mean I'm, once again i don't believe in evangelism right which is like colored by a particular movement in the modern world but I do believe in a call, a call with wisdom and beauty, ihsan, to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go ahead, Sazid. Uh, uh, I was just going to say, add to that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess that type of perennialist thought, um, you know, where like, you know, whoever believes whatever they believe, perhaps God inspired people in different ways to get, uh, to where they are in life, you know, kind of, you know, makes the mind, uh, I guess you could say the decider of what guidance is, uh, you know, my mind is what defines guidance. And, and in our perception, of course, that's, that's very, as Sheikh Yasser was saying, you know, we believe that revelation is what has inspired the minds to guidance revelation is the source of guidance uh, the mind's role in this is perceiving you know and you know, because basically in other words you know it comes up in different discussions if it was up to my mind then you know perhaps i may conceive something i may perceive something that is qabih uh, that is wicked in itself as being pleasant because you know my mind led me to arrive at certain conclusions that uh, doing this act or that act isn't really that bad. Um, and you might find yourself arriving at different conclusions. It's not the mind that, you know, um, uh, defines guidance in, in our Islamic tradition. It's, it's, it's revelation, uh, you know, and, and, and that brings us to the subject of tahsin and taqbih. Uh, you know, God defines what's pleasant. God defines what is wicked. And that's in the guidance of revelation. I, I guess that's one part of it. And the other part of it, the, the, the question, uh, I guess, you know, um, is, um, you know, it, you know, that question isn't like other questions in life where, like you said, like uh, the, the, that question will ultimately decide my eternity, you know, where, where I will be forever. Uh, if I get that one wrong, it's not like getting, all right, well, where, where am I in terms of the COVID discussion about vaccines or any other issue? No, actually, you know, that's the, that question about purpose is something that I'm actually answering with every decision I make in my life with every single passing day. If you look at one of a uh, set of verses in the Quran, Surah Kaf, actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Qul, You want to know who the real losers are? Um, there are people who 
their sa'i, their direction, their, uh, you know, the, what they're striving for in life uh, uh, has completely gone astray. And they think that they're on the right path. So, you know, for me, I guess, you know, that answer of, you know, purpose, what's truth, what's falsehood, uh, uh, you know, what religion I choose to follow. Um, it's not a question I simply answer. And based on that question, I'm going to be either eternally in heaven or internally in hell. Actually, it's something that purpose is something that manifests in the decisions I make throughout my life. And, you know, that's, you know, that's why the Quran says, and just to clarify this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if they were sent back, they would go back to that same behavior because that question of purpose is something that is a culmination of a person's life journey. Uh, it, it, it's it, basically it's it's not uh, it's 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 not like any other question in life, uh, and that's why the consequence for it is not like any other consequence in life either. Too, uh, it's it's basically a lifestyle I choose. Um, uh, uh, something I, I I dedicate my life towards, and something that I'll you know um, that I've embraced and that has defined me. You know, a lot. I, I just want to just for the listeners who may not have understood the context of the verses Shah Hussein just uh, recited. Uh, Allah, Allah there is talking about people who, uh, when the time of death came, ask Allah to send them back to life so that they can you know correct their behavior. And Allah says, and if these people were were to be sent back and given longer life. They would fall back into the same patterns um, for the reasons that Sheikh Osama mentioned. I, I wanted to pose a thought um, about the issue. And I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, paint you this way, Ahmed. Um, it's just something that from the nature of the conversation that we've had and the times that I've had this conversation with people in the past, it seems to jump out at me over and over um, that one of the problems that leads to this like struggle for people is that subconsciously we've bought into the idea that religion is more about personal identity than it is about objective truth. And there's this attempt then by a lot of Muslims because that's the dominant thought pattern. I don't want to be different. And so that is the thought pattern I'm going to take. And so I'm not going to look at religion the same way I look at medical science or you know, other forms of science or mathematics or right, there are things that are objective truth, but it's not religion. Religion is a choice. It's a personal identity. And so why is my religion any better than anybody else's? And so it seems to me that one of the reasons why the logic that I put out in that analogy about you as a doctor versus you as a Muslim, they don't seem to like line up. I wonder if it's because so many of us struggle with just accepting and being pr like like just accepting the fact that no religion is actually objective that there is an objective truth here that is not about me Zaid in my identity it's about revelation which is what the, the shiuch have been I think saying over and over again but I wonder if you guys would if you guys see it the same way I do think that a part of the struggle comes from our inability to just accept that there is an objective truth in this question it, it's not a personal identity thing it, you know I think I think it's a, that's a pr I think it's a pretty solid insight I think that the difference I can only speak of where, where I am, right? I think, um, you know, my understanding of medicine is that it's, you know, I, I, the a thing that I say often to the students who come through me, you know, from a medical perspective, is I say, like, the science isn't as sciencey as we wish it was, right? And that's what? Just, what? The science isn't as sciencey as we wish it was, right? That, that so often, uh, everybody who speaks about science, uh, medicine, I, you know, the famous one is like aspirin, right? Aspirin. Was supposed to be the wonder drug and then we thought it was going to kill everybody and then now we think it's good again but only in certain groups of people and cholesterol medicine you know and, and i used to make a joke in residency when i was a chief resident that like doctors are kind of like goldfish sometimes right we follow wherever they drop the food at the top of the tank and we chase it that way and then it's like oh there's food on that side too let's go there and they all go that way and it just whenever the next literature thing comes out we we uh you know we swear but that's that's the truth so so i i, I kind of fall into a paradigm where i i and everything that I do, right? I'm not um, the type of medicine I practice is, is a little different than like a surgeon or whatever, right? Where there's kind of an obvious answer because outcomes are specifically, you know, a, a certain way when you do a certain type of technique. It's it's uh, it's I you know I work in an ICU, right? Where where uh, where this where the science so often doesn't make any sense, right? We we see people die who objectively 
they shouldn't have died, right? You go, well, how did that person die? I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense, right? And vice versa. You go, how the heck did that person walk out of here? I have no idea what we did differently. We didn't do anything differently. Oh, okay. And then we just kind of like, <laughs> you know, move on. And there's a couple of kind of f- funny, kind of amazing things that happen to anybody who works in an ICU long enough or, or in a hospital long enough, you know, uh, just for kind of a sidebar, just to kind of tell you how I get here to this thought process about the science is, is uh, you know, so often, and, and this is something I tell people, uh, who aren't particularly religious or don't believe there's something else going on that we don't understand, right? My my tangible knowledge of the un, of the of the unknowable, right? If that makes any sense, is is I'm in an ICU and and I'm I mean once a month, right? Like once every couple of weeks, there's somebody who's on their deathbed and they should have died hours ago or days ago, right? Objectively, based on laboratories and, and their blood gases and all this other stuff, and they stick around, and then all of a sudden, some long lost son who hasn't seen them in a decade and a half and wrong them finally comes to the bedside and asks for forget you know finally gets to make contact and the guy's gone the moment after they come right moment. and that's not at a certain point it's not anecdote anymore right like, like for one doctor to see or vice versa right the loving wife is with the husband they've been married for 65 years and she's next to him he's unconscious and in a coma or something you know not cognitively there and she just wants to stay with him and then finally the nurses say listen ma'am you got to go home and get some rest don't worry you know we're gonna take care of him. we'll be here tomorrow and then she goes home and the moment she leaves the bedroom you know the room she, the guy's gone, right? Like there's, there's things that I, even beyond my understanding of religion, right? Or, or God or any of those things, there's obviously things occurring well beyond our, our capacity to measure them, right? And so that's the science isn't sciencey. I can't explain why, why those things happen. So, so I think my comfort in feeling that, uh, that, that things aren't only what I can perceive them to be, I feel pretty comfortable with, right? I feel comfortable saying there are things I don't understand that I can still believe are, are reasonable things to believe at this time, at the very least, right? And it may even be the opposite, right, Zay? Like, it may even be because I'm willing to say that the thing I really strongly hold believe today may actually, the literature may show in six months that I'm actually wrong and I have to be willing to move, right, from my current position is one where I say, Zay, like, I, 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 look, I believe in Islam, I'm, right? I say that a lot and I do all the things I try, do all the things I'm supposed to do and not try to do the things I'm not supposed to do, right? With, with all the flaws that are associated with that, but I try because I think this is the truth. But that's, that's what it is though, is, is that I think that it's the truth. It's not that I, I you know, uh, person X down the road thinks that their truth is the truth. They really, they really do. They're not like, they're not, uh, you know, they're not Abu Lahab who hears the truth and conceals it and says, oh, you know, I'd probably believe, but it came from the prophets. I don't want, you know, it came from Muhammad, so I don't, so, so I don't want to believe it because it would be a shame to my tribe that it came from this family. Like, it's not one of those things. These are not people who are like, I don't want to believe it because this didn't come from my tribe, but Hashem's garbage. Like it didn't come, this is not like, <laughs> this is not those people, right? Uh, maybe there's some amongst them, but I mean, that's not the, the average person that I see here, right? The people I'm speaking about, um, and not to go in circles about this point because you guys have all bought the points to light is, I think my, my problem is uh, how, you have to be willing to believe that, I'm gonna say something strange, like, couldn't it be arrogant for me to say Ahmed Yusuf was born 2020, you know, 1986 and, and is 2021. And for some reason, this guy, you know, Sheikh Yassir, you got the truth, Sheikh Yassir. I don't know why. I don't know. You got chosen, right? You and Zaid and Sheikh Osama and Ahmed Yusuf, you guys are somehow chosen. You guys have the solid truth and the other, you know, 6 billion people that aren't Muslim, they don't, right? And in fact, the half of them that are trying hard also aren't coming to the right conclusion, right? So, so that's a, that's no, I don't, so I, but I would I would push back on that though. I don't because everything that the, that the shiuch have said today, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing in there espouses a sense of like, oh, I'm special, and so God gave me a stem, right? And so now I'm saved. Quite the opposite. They have said over and over again, I can't even tell you where I'm going to go, and that's a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu himself. Like I can't tell you what my end is, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I don't, I can't, I can't see where you're getting the arrogance from. And that's where I keep going. Like, that's why I said the whole identity thing. Like you, like we, whenever we have this conversation, religion is looked at almost exclusively as just like a, something about me as a person. Mm-hmm. It's not about something that's an objective truth. Right. Mm-hmm. And what we're taught is to say, Alhamdulillah, that Allah guided me to the truth, because if Allah hadn't guided me, I wouldn't have come to it. So there's, like, there's no need to be arrogant. In fact, you shouldn't be arrogant. It's completely because God guided you. That doesn't reduce the fact that it's 100% true. Mm-hmm. Or, and, and me being open to the fact that, you know, today, 
like maybe my understanding of Islam today is not complete or not perfect, but certainly my behavior is not complete and not perfect. My intentionality is not complete and not perfect. It doesn't in any way reduce the objective truth of Islam. Mm. And that's and that's why I said what I said. Like I feel like we keep coming back to this fact where it's like, well, that's just you. Well, it's not about me. It's not about you, Ahmed. It's not about Sheikh Hassan. It's not about Sheikh Osama. It's about the objective truth of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That's that's not an issue of identity. Mm. And the other thing, it's it's not my truth. Uh, it, it's uh, it's something that is way before me. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's it's not my personal. And then uh, you know, besides that, you know, it's uh, proximity to it doesn't necessarily mean embracing it. It's like an objective truth, as you're saying. And you know, people who've grown up in it have abandoned it, and people who've grown very far away from it have actually been guided to it. And you know, that's, that's something the Quran says. There are people who were so close to guidance, they grew up in the time of the Prophet, in the city of the Prophet, engaging with the Prophet, yet they rejected the message. And there are people who have grown in a very different time period, a very different geographical location, completely different background, but because it's the objective truth, their hearts embraced it. It's, it's uh, you know, um, if it was my personal truth and you know, I've been only on this earth for X amount of years. Yeah, that would be a very arrogant claim. But if if I if I'm saying it's an age old truth of revelation that dates back to Adam and Noah and Abraham and uh, and so on and so forth, uh, I I think it presents itself in a different light. I think I think it's also a question of whether or not you know in in our books of creed uh, theology. Uh, you know, there's a statement that starts off many of the, these texts where they say, like the reality of things are affirmed. And the pathways of that which takes you to truth is a reality. Like we believe because they're sophists who don't believe in the reality of things. Like there's no reality. There's no truth. Um, you know, and, and there's a there's a version of that in modernity, which is the attack, you know, people who, uh, like, especially in Western academia, they'll attack essentialists, like you're an essentialist, you believe in essentialism, meaning that there's an essential truth. Um, and so there's been this, you know, through liberal secularism, um, this idea of, you know, removing capital T truth, and that there are many, you know, lowercase t truths that everyone can have their own truth. So we, if you will, philosophically believe in the existence of a truth, a reality, right? Allahu al-haq, Allah is the is reality, he is the truth. We believe in the existence of that. So as human beings, because, you know, why would there be the scientific method if we didn't believe in truth? Why would we pursue anything if we didn't believe in truth? You know, we pursue things uh, objectively with a, with a conception of object, 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 objectivity because we believe that there is a reality and that th there's something to be known, discovered, understood. So as in the, in the realm of, of, of existence and the existential questions of why we exist, where we're going, um, you know, where we come from, uh, are, are the questions of theology and religion, we believe in a truth in that space. And so as Muslims, we are pursuing that truth. And, and, and we, we come into this space of surrender um, with humility, right? Islam is a very humbling religion. Islam does not, any Muslim who, who allows their religion to manifest with arrogance has not understood this religion. Like being humble, um, you know, being modest, surrendering lovingly. You know, the servants of the most merciful are those who walk gently on earth. So when we convey, we convey with wisdom, we convey with beautiful words, right? <clears throat> and, and so when we, and when we come into the space of conviction, it's not an arbitrary thing. Yeah, many people embrace religion from a place of fitrah or inheritance. There are millions and millions and millions of Muslims across the world who inherited and, and their fitra, their, their primordial state inclines towards that space. But the people who are involved in a, a type of, uh, you know, dialectic around philosophy and religion and beliefs and existence of God, prophecy, atheism, etc. No, there is an objective argumentation that we can involve ourselves in 
around where truth comes from, how do you know truth, etc. That bifadlillah, that scholars have been very robust in arguing, you know, why we claim that we believe in an objective truth and that the truth as we believe in it is the capital T truth. That we do make that claim. And by the way, we make that claim categorically, right? Now, an interlocutor may reject what I'm saying as Lan said, like, what, who, who are you to have? Yeah, we, but that's my, like my convictions. You know, if I, for example, am in the space of, uh, uh, you know, a dialectical theology, like where I'm, you know, in argumentation and comparing and contrasting and so on. So there is, there, there, there is a claim that we make and our claim is categorical and that the, the capital T truth is that God exists and that God sent messengers and prophets and the last one is the prophet Muhammad, right? Our belief in that <clears throat> is not arrogance. <laughs> you know, our conviction in that is not an arrogant enterprise. It is, it is our, our you know, attempt through the, these mechanisms of the mind and of the inherited you know, tradition, the oral tradition from the past, to surrender to this reality and, and to say, God, we seek you, we desire you, we surrender to you, we seek you as the truth, right? And that's, that's I, I, I think, hopefully a better framing, and I hope I was clear, maybe I was a little too philosophical, but hopefully that is a better framing to think about, you know, why we come into beliefs and why what we believe in is not arrogance. Because it's like, then it would be like, hold on, you as a doctor, you know, or let's say a team of surgeons came in and said, hey, listen, we have to operate on this uh, tumor in this particular way. If I were to come and say, you, you guys are just arrogant, you know, how could, how do you know with such certainty that this is like, no, no, we know <laughs> with 99.9% .9 certainty that this tumor needs to be operated on this way. And there's a consensus. No one's going to sit there and be like, hey, you guys are just a bunch of arrogant surgeons. Well, some people will, but <laughs> yeah, and they would be, and that's true, and they would be rejected, and yeah. they would be laughed off the earth. <laughs> you know, it's so like, thank you. You know, your rejection is nonsensical. I, I think it's a, a phenomenal point. I, I, I'm just going to ask, just for the sake of pushing back, uh, for the sake of dialogue, is to say, in any one of those problem solving type situations, right? Like problem solving the unit, this is the biggest problem solving problem, right? Which is like, what's the purpose of life and how, why do we exist and all that other stuff. But, but, in the surgeon example or the medical example or whatever examples we all encounter in, in our careers or whatever, like there actually almost always isn't one answer. That, that, that is the truth. The truth is, yeah, the surgeons may come to consensus that a surgery needs to be done, but how it's done is very different, right? Even from the people that trained in the same place. Uh, you know, the, the best doctors in the country have very different ways they're treating COVID two years later. Um, uh, not very different ways, but, you know, nuanced ways, right? That they're, that they're treating COVID later with the way they manage a ventilator, right? We all, we all, me and my partner treat it differently. When I go back and get his patients at the end of his week, I come back and go, oh man, I got to change all these settings because I don't do it this way, right? And, and so my point, what we're asking in this most important question then, right? Is that there's only one answer, right? And that, that's, that's what I'm hearing at least is despite this universe or this life giving us countless examples of that almost never being the right answer, but there's only one. This one, the most important question, there is only one. I like Zaid's face. I want to hear your. No, face. but you're. But you're. No, no. But I actually don't. I, it, because it, the, the the problem here is a user problem, yeah. <laughs> not a truth problem. <laughs> like the truth is the truth. Like the, still, the reality is that there is a disease that exists. It's a, it's a it's a single disease. Like it's not a it's not a disease that like. Well, from your perspective, it's this disease, and from my yeah, perspective, sure. this disease. I'm, I'm not going to respect that. No, there's. It's just that you just don't know, right? Or you may not. Like your 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 evidence leads you to a a conclusive percentage of like I don't know ninety two percent. Like I'm ninety two percent confident that this sure. is the case, or ninety five percent. But I think everyone in that realm would still affirm that there is a reality and there is a disease and there is a problem and there is a you know tremendous likelihood it's either one of these two things or one of these three things. Sure. Right. So but I also. Yeah. You know, I would say just in addition, uh, you know, it's the difference is, you know, you, you know, your varying approaches as doctors is based in experience. Uh, 
It's, it's not, you know, what we're speaking about here is based in revelation. And even when we're talking about things relating to revelation, there are certain absolutes, absolute truth, and they're very few, you know, like uh, you'll never find a difference of opinion among scholars in the Islamic tradition of whether there's a day of judgment or not, you know, but that diversity that you seek in the search for truth is actually, you know, very much prevalent in the Islamic tradition and most of its details. Uh, but again, there's absolute truth and there's details. Um, you know, that's like, you know, a good example for this would be like uh, in any other, you know, worldly reality where we have certain absolutes that, you know, uh, no sane person would differ about. If you have certain examples, you're the, you're the doctor here, so you'd be the best person to come up with examples in the medical field. Like, what are the absolutes where, like, if someone denies this, they're an absolute buffoon, uh, you know, but, you know, most things, yeah, they're very diverse in nature. Same thing in the Islamic tradition. Most things, there's so much room for diversity, interpretation, and that's actually celebrated. But for the absolute truths, the, you know, that's something that's categorical. Uh, sorry, Sheikh. Yeah, no, no. And I, I just want to, I mean, that's a very good point, Zekalach, Sheikh Osama, for bringing that up, because he, he the, the subtlety that he started off with, I hope people picked up on it, which is there's a difference between like discovery and uncovering through like a method of negotiating the material realm and trying to discover like so dissecting the body and trying to understand. Then there are truths that are inherited that are passed down, right? That are that have come through, you know, um ijma, that have come through you know, the, 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 the vast super highway that has always existed. So that, you know, there, there are ways because I actually didn't finish the statement I started. And the pathways to knowing those truths are also existent. And those pathways are the senses. So what you use through discovery and, you know, you'll learn, for example, that fire burns through your senses. You know, the, the first man probably touched fire. Oh, you know, that burns. They didn't know that that, that burns inherently, just through experience. So through dissection, through the scientific method, through whatever, we'll try to understand some truths about the material realm. Then there is truths that are known through the rational mind, right? One plus one equals two. You don't know that through experience. You don't know that through, uh, uh, or the, the senses meaning, you don't know that through senses or experience, and you don't know that through revelation, you know that through the rational mind, one plus one equals two, it's just, it's a rational conclusion. And then there are the truths that come to you from, from revelation, right? Yeah. You know truths through revelation, truths that are passed down, right? And that's, and, 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 and we even, by the way, even atheists, uh, uh, or, you know, they call it al khabar al-sadiq, the scholars call it like the truthful accounts, even atheists have to believe in this uh, idea because they have to believe in the fact that the way you know anything in the past is through truthful accounts, like that you will not deny the existence of the, the Roman Empire because you have, you know, gen you know, generations and generations of accounts that affirm the existence of the Roman Empire, right? Or even going further, you know, um, and so, you know, this is just to indicate to people, I don't want us to go too like, you know, uh, into this space, <laughs> but it's just to understand that there is a truth and there are pathways to knowing the truth. And as modern people, we cannot allow relativism, relativism and subjectivism to take over, right? Our spaces, mm -hmm. because there is, you know, in, 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 in so many fields, we believe in truth, but when it comes to religion, there has been a proactive measure taken to eliminate the even discussion of a possible truth. And the default by most, most atheists, especially in polemical discourse, is to say, well, look at how arrogant you are to affirm the existence of God. I'm the humble one. I'm the one who says, I don't know. Yes, sir, I'm your Habibi. How about that? <laughs> so, I, I, I want to make sure Zaid, uh, we've addressed Zaid face that I got full, I got 100% Zaid face during that question. So I'm sure. you guys Zaid face, you guys Zaid face hard. hard. Right, go ahead, go, go ahead. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. So if you want to get some, okay. oh, sorry, is it, is it two hours? Just making sure because I have no, I have, no, I just I, I'm reading, I'm reading the room. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I have, I have. No, a, no, the room is. I'm, I'm, I'm fresh. I'm just, I'm burning some more bukhur right now. We're ready. <laughs> I have two. I have two major kind of questions left uh, in my head, at least from from the conversations we had. One was gonna break off, and before we kind of got onto this relative tangent, one was so. So 
you know, we, you talked about not wanting to be evangelical in the way that we are the conveyors of the message, right? That, that, that seems pretty clear. I think, you know, I think I get what you mean, right? I, I think it's, we, we know, I think especially now it's like distasteful almost, right? <laughs> to be evangelical in religiosity anyway, right? It's kind of like falling out of favor after it being really exciting. But beyond that, I, you know, uh, do the relationships that I have with non-Muslims, right, around me, all have to be painted by an intention to convert them. I'm going to be like as flat as possible on the question, but but um, and and is that is that is that insincerity, right? It, meaning meaning, you know, I stop on the side of the road because I see somebody in trouble, right? And uh, and and man, you know, if I was wearing a kufi in my beard and I had an abaya on, it'd be a great way to start a conversation, right? <laughs> like or am I stopping on the side of the road because I'm supposed to? This is who I'm be, who I am, right? As a uh, follower of, of, of the, you know, in the footsteps of, of the people before us. So, I mean, that's, that's the, the gist of the question in, in short. Sure, some of you want me to go for it? Fadl Maulana. See, that's all. deference is given to the one who has the most books. The, um, I would say the following, you, you do good things because it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't do anything other than for the sake of Allah, right? And that's something that every human being and Muslims in particular should understand. You do things for the sake of Allah. You're attaining, trying to attain his pleasure. In terms of the question of should every relationship be colored by this lens of con you know, converting them? I don't think that, first off, you are converting anyone into anything. Right, <laughs> you know, uh, con Allah is the one who in Allah yahdi in Allah yahdi man yasha. Allah guides the one that He desires and wills. I believe, however, yes, I would say that every Muslim should feel a a responsibility and a duty um, as a servant of Allah, as a follower of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to convey, to convey the beauty of Islam, to convey the truth of Islam to convey the tenets of Islam. Now, how you do that is you do that through wisdom and you do that using the most beautiful and excellent of language and, 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 and circumstances, right? You should be very thoughtful. Um, yeah, you don't, you're not walking around, like I said, with the Quran at every corner. Hey, let me tell you quickly about the Quran. No, that's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is that you are a Muslim. You are identifiably a Muslim. Dr. Ahmed Yusuf, right? Ahmed is an, another name of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Yusuf is a prophet of God, Joseph. You know, and, and you speak in this language. You, you, you illustrate who you are in reality. Because it's, it's it, a part of modern hypocrisy is that we are taught to hide the most essential part of ourselves, which is our tradition, our faith, our belief in God. Yeah, present everything else, you know, that you're a really good doctor, really accomplished, you have your business, you have your degrees, you have your family, you have this, even you can talk about a little bit about your political opinion, but keep your religion out of this, please. Like, it's just, it's annoying. No, like, you have to understand this is an essential part of who I am, right? And, and, and if, if we're going to be, especially in the modern discourse, you know, we're going to have to be in the business of affirming people, right? Affirming and, uh, you know, uh, accepting and whatever. Then we have to, then Muslims have to learn that not, I mean, more than just like a constitutional right, but more critically than that is that we have a divine mandate, right? To, 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 to be callers to the way of Udru, Udru ila sabili rabbik, call to the way of your Lord. Right. So that's what we're doing. And and, and I, w the reason why I try to distinguish it from evangelism, because unfortunately, when you you're calling to religion, everyone in the modern era, especially in so many of the circles that we are in, is colored by, you know, the, the Bible thumping groups. Right. And it's like, you know, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're going to go, you know, you're going to uh, that's 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 not our discourse. That's not our approach. That's not our spirit. That's not our ethic. We do good, not like we're not giving you the bread in one hand and the Quran in the other hand in that very like cheap transactional way. No, we do good as Muslims, 
as servants of Allah, because Allah loves first to see us do good, right? And in, 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 and when we're around people, whether they are people we are helping or people that we are, uh, are they are our neighbors, we tell them about the beauty of our religion in ways that are, are wise, right? It's not the first conversation, it's not the second, maybe it's the 10th, maybe it's this, maybe it's something that brings up um, a topic of, of, of interest. It's natural, organic, right? But it comes from love and it comes from deep care for the people around me. Allahu Akbar. Uh, Ahmed, can you just surrender to Allah? I was gonna, I forgot in my intro, I wanted to caveat the fact that I think I want everyone to know who's listening that Ahmed is a a very near and dear person to all of our hearts. Like, this is not, I know maybe you don't know him, but he's very close to us. He's a very pious Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my goal, my goal, I think my goal. And he's is, doing a lot of devil's advocacy yes, kind of stuff. That's what I was going to caveat and, it. Yeah, but. So he's not like, you know, or, or maybe there's some things that are missing from the context of this conversation. So I'm not coming as like a doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> Arkansas changed me, man. You don't know. You don't know me. No, but I think, I think that was, I was actually going to say that, uh, I probably should say in the intro, I think, I think to make the discussion more meaningful, obviously, I, I want to take positions that, sure. you know, maybe I have had at certain points in my life, and maybe I have them now, it just depends on kind of how I wake up in the morning. But but in general, I think my hope is, uh, if, if I'm going to be helpful in, in the way we tackle some of the issues is present a lay person like myself, you know, some of the things that I've thought about, you know, you know, as, 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 I've, as I've grown, um, and, and shrunk right <laughs> as, as a muslim so i think I'll, I'll try to continue to be that um you know in the conversations going forward you know i so so i guess i guess the the the, the last kind of real question i think that I, I had um prepared is a little more specific and i think it's already been answered somewhat in a lot of the answers i've received but i thought i'd just follow through with the question because it was at least a unique uh finding for me in my readings right and so so you know i came by a hadith that was <laughs> Don't ask me how I got here. It came, it came in a very complex uh, Sufi Salafi argument <laughs> that I was watching from afar. And the conversation, somebody accused somebody of worshiping graves and this whole entire thing came up. And there's a hadith that was presented um, that I, I believe is a Muslim that, that the Prophet was with the Sahaba at a point and he went somewhere and came back. And I'm going to paraphrase terribly. I'm sorry, but uh, this is the English paraphrased version I read. So, so you know, came back to the Sahaba and he, was, he had tears in his eyes or he had obviously been crying. And uh, they asked him kind of what's up. And he said, I visited the grave of my mother. And, and, uh, and when they asked him why he was crying, he said something along the lines of, um, so I said that, that uh, uh, I had asked Allah for the permission to ask for her forgiveness. Uh, and I was denied this permission. And then I asked Allah if I could visit the grave and I was given the permission to, to, to visit the grave. And that was kind of, that was the backdrop of how the question, how the hadith was presented. And I was like, I never heard this before because I had always, uh, assumed right that the uh, that the prophet Sassam's mother was was in was a Muslim, <laughs> right? I guess I guess was a you know was a believer in the way that I grew up believing, right? You know, you always heard about Abu Talib's position, right? The uncle of the Prophet Sassam, and we know the many hadith about that that the difficulty in him not being able to bring him in the fold of Islam, at least at least from I think the majority opinion I've learned as a lay person. But but this was kind of it was somewhat shocking to me. So first is Am I interpreting this hadith right? Because it was a, it's a Sheikh Google uh, <laughs> um, collection of the hadith. I didn't hear this from from uh, you know the math of something knowledgeable. Uh, and then two is is the bigger question. Then if 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 it is right, and I guess it could be extended to the uncle of the prophet or or the father of the prophet or the grandfather of the prophet and so on. And they may all be different answers to my question. Um, and again, right? I understand you may have answered this already in a way, and I may get the similar answer. But I think it's just a question that. That kind of camp in my mind is how, how do we rec how do we reconcile that huge uh <laughs> you know the house of the prophet the 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 womb from which the prophet was born uh the kind you know being in the home for the first six years of his life and so on and and all those things and then that person um at least based on my understanding of this hadith not being in a good place right uh, assuming that the reason the prophet couldn't ask for forgiveness for her because you're not supposed to ask forgiveness for those who have passed that weren't Muslim, right? I think that's the the jump I'm making here. So I'll just leave it there and 
first correct me and then and then <laughs> tell me if the question makes any sense. So I, I do want to ask a clarifying question though. Mm. Um, you you have no issue with the fact that his uncle, who was very, very close to him, Abu Lahab, is like spoken about in the Quran, <laughs> like definitively he is in Jahannam. You have mm -hmm. no issue with that, even though Abu Lahab was someone yeah. close to him, the child, and that he, he definitely had love for as an uncle who yeah. looked after him. Yeah, I think, I think it's a fantastic point. And they're definitely, maybe because I grew up always knowing that, right? Like from such a yeah. young kid, as a Muslim kid, you kind of learn that story, right? And it's, you know, it's sad that the Prophet Sassan's uncle, he never became Muslim, but he took care of him. And, and you know, he gets the minor punishment as a consequence of being kind, all that stuff that we've learned since we were kids. Maybe I'm just desensitized to that reality, but this kind of maybe opened up that, you know, I don't want to use the word like wound, right? Because that's not that's not the right thing. That's not what I mean to say, because that also makes me sound like a, <laughs> a cafe. So that's not what I mean. What I mean is like the, the natural, I think the natural human discomfort, right? I think that's a natural human discomfort that, that um, somebody, who the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loves so dearly, right? Like, obviously, and it's a good example. You're right. The Abu Talib thing is very- it's Abu Lahab, I didn't say Abu Talib. Abu Lahab. Oh. Okay, Abu, Abu Lahab is specifically mentioned in the Quran. But... Sure, sure. Yeah, but you know, Abu Lahab was like a mean dude, right? <laughs> like he was- But, but there's, no, there's no doubt that the Prophet loved him, though, is my point. Right? Sure. And he, and he celebrated the Prophet's birth. There are explicit hadith about it. Like, I'm yeah. just trying to highlight the difference here. Yes, it's but like, I think the assumption difference would be, and and yeah, that's a good point though. But I think the assumption difference would be, I think mean, Abu Talib is a better example in my mind because, uh, you know, from far away, Abu Talib loved the, loved the beloved right until the day he died. You imagine based upon the way the relationship seemed at least right, and 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 um, you of course assume his mother did right because he was a kid by the time she passed away, and so all these things. Yeah, so I definitely put Abu Talib in a different category. He's much easier to be like, man, the guy deserted right, like dumped intestines and was mean to people and was killing people. I mean, there's like, he persecuted people, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that make me be like, ah, that guy, you know, maybe he deserved it, but the, the, he obviously deserved it. But the point is, you know, Abu Talib, who was <laughs> beloved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just jump to the shield. I, I think we got the question. <laughs> I'm not having you talk yourself into a corner anymore. Let me ramble. Listen, I, this is far more enjoyable. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, he definitely deserves it. Go, it's a bad guy. Go. <laughs> Listen, I think you need to be on the member. Nah, but that's the conclusion that I have today. That kind of a football go, you know? Like, hey, hey, you know? Come on, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sheikh Usama, do you have anything to say? Um, yeah, I, I heard you're an expert on this issue, so. No, uh, no, I'm not an expert. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm waiting to listen to you. <laughs> Stand in front of the bullet, yes, Sheikh Yasser. No, there's no bullets. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come on, there's no bullets. Why is that? Uh, but I maybe, should know. Maybe like, in, I, I, in Arkansas there are some bullets, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I do have to be honest though. I, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, how, like, like what connection you made between this subject and sort of. I guess I could see in a way uh, what you're trying to say, like, well, what does this have to do with the whole perenni perennialist thought and, uh, you know, about, um, I guess, uh, what we were discussing for most of the, you know, where's the, where's the, the link, I guess you could say. Is that, is that my question to me? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah, so maybe Zaid has my answer because I think he might think what I'm thinking, but go ahead, Zaid. Yeah, yeah, you. so I, I think, I think where this, the genesis of this question came from was like the, the, the first part of this conversation was around the fact that Ahmed feels a lot of love for these people that he's dealing with day to day. And he wants them, he sees good from them. And so he wants them in Jannah. So we went through that whole conversation. And so he then connected that to, well, the Prophet said him loved some people very dearly who also were good to him, right? Like his mother, like Abu Talib. Um, and like, he's trying to reconcile. So it's not just, it's not just little old me, Ahmed. It's even the Prophet said him. And he's trying to then reconcile God's justice and mercy with the fact that these people who love the prophet and he loved them back, as far as he understands it, are uh, are punished. Yeah. For eternity, right? Like forever. This is real life. <laughs> this is, cool. It's, 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 it's the ultimate, life. ultimate punishment. It's the real life. life. Yeah, I, I think at face, I, I see the connection. I think at face value, though, um, you know, it would actually, you know, prove the opposite sentiment uh, yeah. of what you uh, were, were expressing in the beginning, you know, because, you know, that, you know, based on its wording, but that's at face value, 
I think when you investigate further, I think there's a lot more to it than uh, what meets the eye, I guess you could say. And I think uh, Sheikh Yasser would love to share that with us. <laughs> I mean, so, but I, I'm so sorry. If I, if I could just ask Sheikh Osama just to clarify, you mean by that because like even the Prophet you know, loved and was loved, it wasn't a guarantee of Jannah. So who are we to say that because I loved and was loved that this person should be a person of Jannah? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. At face value, I think, in the, you know, that that's the message that's in in, in that tradition. Um, if you were to just stop at there, you know, and it would be actually the opposite point of, uh, yeah. you know, I guess that whole thing that we're trying to unpack, like if I love someone and God's merciful, well, you know, why can't I just believe that they'll be in Jannah, even if they're not Muslim? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Sheikh, Sheikh, you hit it on the head. The reason the reason I kind of bring it in is because obviously I've been thinking about this for a long time. Right? This is a lot of thought on this, and, and this is an example that I've given myself when I say even the most beloved has experienced this. Uh, I mean, he probably didn't experience the, the conflict in his heart the same way, right? It obviously didn't, right? But I mean, he's experienced the loss of somebody in the context of him not being a believer when he wished they could have been, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but you know, saying my for the sake of right the devil's advocate our conversation point is is like is that is that, so you're saying just because he experienced bad things that we're all going to experience this bad thing it still feels like a bad thing and i, I am oversimplifying it right yeah. um because I, I obviously don't believe that it's it's bad if it's from a love but i mean that's that's the feeling of of the question at the very least well so i i think that is the crux um of the discussion and i think you know reconciling between kind of god's decree and where things may be headed and how god will destine certain realities and and so i think there is an evident reconciliation so i think that was covered i don't i mean there is a big thing that was opened and uh, however it's not going to be closed today <laughs> But it's the topic of the salvation of the prophet's uh, parents. And, um, you know, I, I personally do follow and attribute, I follow a belief that says that the prophet's parents are saved. Um, however, to elucidate that will take work and time. <laughs> and we are at the end of a two plus hour uh, podcast. So I don't think this is the time to do that. Um, However, I, you know, and so, there, and, and there's plenty to be said, there's plenty of scholars who have like really built out the evidence around this particular topic, but I just want to give a nasiha to Muslims um, in general, and that is, there is in, in Surah al in Surah al Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the middle of one of the verses, he says, in ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِي النَّبِي that This is verily something that hurts the Prophet. Now, he's referring to things that may hurt the Prophet, so he would you know, castigate the companions for, you know, in, in doing anything that would hurt the prophet. Many modern Muslims, unfortunately, are very cavalier about when they talk about the prophet's uh, mother, uh, father, uncle. And these are people that he loved very deeply. All I'll say is be very careful not to hurt the prophet. It's, it, it is not my business, <laughs> you know, it means it does not change any reality to me in practical, actionable terms for me to say that, uh, you know, Sayyidina Muhammad's mother or uncle or, or father, etc. is X. Um, and, and especially if it will hurt the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's something that we from a place of adab, ma'ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have to factor in. Now, for those of you who are listening, who are like, sorry, but, you know, we have a hadith. Yes, there is an academic scholarly discourse that is had within the rubric of adab about trying to synthesize and make sense of kind of the inherited tradition. And then there are conclusions that may be had, but those conclusions are taken in a way that is, you know, we don't talk about these realities, meaning... We don't indulge in a, a type of dialogue or discourse that, that, is, that, that has su adab, that has a type of callousness to it when talking about the Prophet Sallallahu mother, right? And I'm not talking about you, Ahmed, or anyone here. Like, I know no one was callous or disrespectful. Oh, yeah. On the, on the contrary, my, my discomfort comes from yeah, yeah. a feeling of 
how could like yeah. Yeah. for the one right like that's that's my yeah but, but it's 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 it, I, you know we but so my point is like i don't want anyone to i'm there is a scholarly discourse around this particular issue and i do follow the scholars that say that the prophet ﷺ's parents are saved najun they are saved and they have a whole you know discourse around that reconciling between ayat and ahadith and etc that's a that's a that's a, a more involved discourse but for the for the lay person that's none of i i'll say this very bluntly it's literally none of your business <laughs> like like you know, do not like in the Nabi. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah was very explicit about the things that hurt the Prophet. Um, you know, but 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 we don't we don't and so we don't want to be in the business in a kind of banter kind of space or just chit chat or you know, just oh really, you know, the Prophet, because I've heard people, you know, unfortunately, even some people on the member. Talk about the Prophet's mother in Hellfire with such confidence and uh, anger, you know, at disbelief or something like they have this false conception that somehow they are going to clearly articulate and manifest like true belief against disbelief and then and throw, you know, and I think that is a very dangerous and disrespectful thing to do. I'm not saying it's disrespectful to follow an opinion of scholars that may conclude that perhaps these ayat indicate or these ahadith indicate the contrary. I mean, the, if it's a scholarly thing, then you, a, a true scholar will be very humble, will be very careful, will be very thoughtful about surrendering to the truth, and, and that's it. And it's not, this is not a subjective thing. So I'm not saying we're going to err on the side of like, no, 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 no. Truth is truth. But the, the truth around this particular topic and issue, there are plenty of scholars that have indicated that they are saved. And, and there are some that indicate that, that perhaps she isn't. And, but that's, those, are, those are questions that we as a community should have be very respectful and kind of about, right? Um, I just, I, I wanted to give that as a last point of adab. But if there's another time in the future to discuss, like just so the conclusion is, given the nature of our conversation, that particular discourse is 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 not essential to, to this, like what we've been talking about. I am, though, however, articulating that I do follow opinion that says they are saved. Um, and there is a very valid opinion that says that. And, you know, uh, and inshallah, maybe in a future time, we can, with Adab, talk a little bit more about it in the scholarly text, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair, Shaykhna, give a little room. Ahmed, Sheikh Osama, anything additional that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say? Nope. Nope. Good. Alhamdulillah. Um, I ask Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accept this from all of us. Uh, to all the listeners, inshallah you've made it this far. Um, <laughs> but I did want to remind you, if, if you did have questions pertaining to this topic, like follow-up questions at some point in the near future, we'll do another Ask Me Anything. Um, and you can always send your questions. If like you reflected on it right now, you can send it. The number again is 862-208-3638. 862-208-3638. That'll come straight to us, inshallah. Um, we'll hopefully have an um, email or a message up, message board up soon where you guys can put them up. Um, but you know, be sure to send us your questions on this topic or your suggestions or your thoughts about the topic. Um, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.